Hello guys, welcome back to Not Just Mecha. It's Marco here, and today we paint using uh, textures. So, is it possible to paint without actively and purposely blend and smooth out transitions and layers? It's a bit anticlimactic, but uh, the answer is, yeah, sure. And if you think about it, Games Workshop did it for years with the original three-color system and the heavy metal style, but we can push that idea a bit a lot farther with the textures and cool unorthodox techniques. To take an healthy step away from the saturated warm settings of the last few videos, this time I went for a cold winter environment, imagining Mogan Ra as a ghostly apparition in perfect harmony with the surroundings. A mix of an hunter and a sniper in winter camouflage, with a hint of the Eldari ethereal nature coming from the faded colors and the falsely monochromatic scheme, but still concrete and grounded in the physical world by the textures. And I made the rifle in a more classic heavy metal style to show that texturing is not a way to hide crimes or cut the working time, but a proper storytelling tool. Don't forget to drop a like to help the diffusion of this video and the channel, and of course subscribe to join my painting journey in every corner of the hobby. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page, where you can find articles, extra material, and the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! I start with a quick, light, zenithal coat of a neutral grey. The only purpose of this step is to give me the ability to see and understand the macro shapes that in a small model crowded with details becomes just a dark blur under the satin black primer. I don't consider this as a proper first step, but more like adjusting the lights on the table to see better what I'm doing, so feel free to skip it. The real work and the deep dive into texturing starts with titanium white. I lower the pressure to obtain this kind of super fine dotting. I want to deliver the idea that the fabric of the cape is not woven interlacing threads like humans do, but that it's something grown, like a deformation of Wraithbone. So my plan is to overlap layers of different textures to sell a complex, disorganized, organic nature. I've used a similar approach in the last video on the larger scale of a bust, but I really wanted to show you how to use it on miniatures. To adapt the grit, aka the size and spread of the dotting, I have simply played a bit with the different low pressures, using a weaker push to obtain a bigger and looser pattern on the gladiator, and here a slightly higher pressure for a finer and more subtle rendering of the same effect. Of course, you can also use this variability to give the idea of different materials in the same scale. I apply a higher density of dots where more light hits the shapes, the areas where your eyes can naturally perceive more details in high resolution, because of the higher number of photons bouncing back, and I let them fade into the shadows, creating the illusion with a progressively lower density. And this is all I do with the airbrush, from now on it's all about the brushwork. Similar idea for the real Wraithbone, but to sell the sensation of a totally different material, I completely changed the way in which I apply the color, using a controlled and super fine dry brushing. The gentle hand that, I have to admit, didn't deliver the wanted effect on the gladiator skin, here becomes crucial to paint the extremely small grit and micro roughness of the bone. In the pictures all this work becomes extremely subtle, with the camera bringing out mainly the sharper brushstrokes, but I paint for the real life experience of the model, and in person all this foundational work makes the shapes catch and bounce light in totally different ways, like proper different materials. With 
with the sketch in place, I can prime in color the few little elements that will express a higher and more solid initial tone or saturation, simply using undiluted GW contrast paints. I paint also all the metal parts with an opaque coat of neutral silver that I turn into a cold antique gold, simply layering in transparency plague bearer flash on top of the silver. This is all the preparation I need before moving to a super fun step with oil paints. What I'm really doing in this project is painting a bunch of slightly different kinds of white. There are a ton of ways to tackle this problem, but the combination of uh, my working over a value sketch and my need for subtle ethereal shades makes the situation perfect for the magic of oil paints. On the channel, I've used oils mainly for uh, light washes or for proper opaque painting with uh, their heavy body, but there is a universe of techniques between uh, these uh, two extremes, and here I'm going to use a mix of additive and subtractive painting based on their versatile levels of transparency and coloring power. I use a selection of uh, semi-transparent and uh, semi-opaque dark tones with uh, strong staining pigments, information that uh, you can easily find printed on their tubes, to paint with a single application the basic tones, all the mid-tones, going up to the first lights and the initial light shadows, and all the possible levels of uh, deep shadows. I know, because of their dark values, it's a bit difficult to appreciate the different shades on the palette, but if you check again the selection of tubes in the first scene of this step, you can see that they are a 50-50 range of cold and warm colors, and I use the different temperatures not only to set an interesting scheme, but also to create a flow of internal contrast between lights and shadows. It doesn't matter what hue I apply to a specific element. To sell the idea of the cold environment, with its eye-catching internal contrast, I paint warm shadows and cold lights. I choose the levels of dilution and the thickness of the layers applied to the model, based on the impact I want to obtain on the surface. For example, I use more thinner and less paint for the bones, because I want to see more of the original white, and dense paint in thick applications on the coat, because I need lower values and more color on it. Time for my favorite part, the subtractive stage. The idea is simple, and it's a trick that uh, takes advantage of the slow drying nature of oils. The shadows are all in place, and I create the mid values and the first lights, removing paint. I hit the same spots I would touch with a brush to paint uh, normal lights, but I use uh, dry q-tips and uh, makeup sponges to bring out the luminosity of the sketch. It's important to point out that I didn't use any varnish, because my main objective was to stain the black and white underpainting, and varnish prevents uh, this precise effect. Varnish can be useful when you need to end up with a super sharp definition and precise panel lines, but if you want the colors and the different types of paint to really interact, you don't want anything between them. 
and I can use a bit of a white spirit to increase my ability to remove paint and obtain all the consequent extra modulation and depth. Q-tips and sponges also create new subtle textures and artifacts in their moving and removing paint, and everything goes into that tactile mix of sensations. But I have to be careful in being quite light-handed, because stepping into overblending is extremely easy here. Again, this is not a bad thing, and a total game changer when painting smooth materials, but here I want to keep some grit. This is the result after about an hour of work. I want to make clear that this is not a speed painting video, and I'm not chasing speed in any way, but still, this is a damn efficient process. All the recesses and the shadows got a consistent layer of oils, and even the cleaner lights have a good amount of paint on, so I let the model rest overnight before moving to acrylics. Now, I can hear you say, but Marco, you inscrutable enigmatic paint slinger, why don't you keep using oils for lights and details? Well, you can totally do it. And it's a charming, elegant process that we'll explore for sure in the very next future, but for the level of sharp texturing that I have in mind, and for the pure efficiency of the process, they are not the absolute best, and since I can visually obtain a tiny bit more, for a tiny bit less stress, I'm happy to switch palettes that, even if based on a different kind of paint and extremely light values, still follows the same idea of contrasting temperatures. I have a colder and a warmer light blue, a colder and a warmer purple, a colder and a warmer light skin tone, plus white on the side, and a colder and a warmer red. Even if I'm focusing my attention only on the small areas between light midtones and extreme lights, shapes and details falling inside the direct main light will be painted with colder shades, and the ones moving away from it and leaning towards the shadows will be warmer. This way, even in this tight scheme, every little element will deliver something interesting to look at a coherent flow of tones, and complex repetitions of the main general contrast. If you check my palette and my way of applying paint to the model, you can clearly see that what I mean with painting with textures is not about slapping thick paint to the model, or maybe renounce to subtlety and control, but quite the opposite. The objective is uh, to introduce a strong sense of the nature and consistency of the materials, but using the thick mass of heavy body paint is just uh, one of many possible ways to deliver the effect. It's for sure a super effective technique, with a strong visual impact that I really like, but it doesn't suit the character that I'm painting here, or better, the mental image that I have of the character. Plus, I want to actively show that heavily textured doesn't mean crusty. The tactile part of the paint job has been set in the value sketch, and now I'm going full illustrational, using semi-opaque brushstrokes to draw new levels of textures. This more delicate impact is obtained using a bit of water and a good amount of medium in every mix. This way I get uh, soft applications that I can layer and layer and layer over each other, but with uh, super sharp brush strokes that uh, don't lose uh, their density and that always stay precisely where I put them. Or like working on the rifle, I simply use pure opaque paint to get the heavy metal hedge highlights.
And again, this is only one of the levels of control you have at your disposal. The shapes of all these brush strokes are what makes all the difference. On the coat, for example, I use uh, long, chunky lines to give the idea of something like a compacted cobweb. While the work on the bones is all about short, thin scratches and little irregular smudges when I arrive to larger open surfaces. On the blade and the few metallic elements I switch to a more solid dotting of metallic paint, mostly to take away its shiny smoothness, make it look mean and rough, and make the body of the rifle look even sleeker by comparison. I know that you are super curious about my recent obsession for acrylic gouache, and I promise that sooner than later I'll make a proper clickbait review. But these days I'm quite inspired and I really feel the need to paint as much as I can, so I'm going to sneak some information about them while you watch me painting. Traditional gouache behaves a lot like watercolors, because even after the application it can be reactivated by water and easily moved around to create complex shades and blends, but the difference is that it's absurdly vibrant and saturated, incredibly opaque and always, always crazily matte. For these reasons, it's used a lot in old school cell animation and in commercial art for posters, illustrations, comics and works of design. Acrylic wash is made using an acrylic binder that adds its quick drying, stabilizing properties to the mix. You lose of course the ability to reactivate the paint, but you still get all the other features. In a general heavy body consistency, easy to spread and move over any kind of media. So the high density, saturation, opacity, strength, the beautiful vibrancy perfect for sci-fi and fantasy, and the reliable solid matte finish make them perfect for my brushwork style on miniatures. The only downside of this textural, illustrational approach is that I never really know when to stop adding details. And in this case the choice is made even more difficult by the amount of large, flowing surfaces at disposal. As a general rule, I call the model done when I start seeing the first signs of diminishing returns. If a few brush strokes don't add anything to the picture, or even become something that I have to fix, it's time to drop the brush. And here is the final result. Elder models are always a great canvas for this kind of painterly, illustrational approaches, and a great exercise in filling flat, empty spaces. Because of the constant exposure to commercial house styles, super clean, smooth blends are still a core element of our image of miniature painting and our training as miniature painters. 
Don't get me wrong, that's an essential skill to master, but it's not the only way to do things, or the right look for every model. Plus, in every other media, smoothness is uh, really not a big deal, to the point where oil painters and often uh, digital artists discourage relying uh, too much on extensive heavy blends because of the risk of uh, losing vibrancy when uh, you mix physical colors, character and the energy coming from the brushstrokes. In paintings, every brushstroke has a strong functional and aesthetic meaning, and like miniatures, they are meant to be seen from a certain distance, where the single brushstrokes naturally become part of the whole picture and the larger design. So why can't we do the same? But if you want to see it under a more direct and less cerebral angle, well, anything full of cool details is more interesting than a flat, empty surface. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys.